Welcome to another edition of Davidson and Company. My guest, Howard Cropler, is the author of Vanville Cup Races of Long Island. Howard is considered the leading expert on the history of the event. And Howard, welcome to the program. Thank you, Larry. It all starts with the aforementioned William K. Vanderbilt, Jr. Right. What do you tell us about him? Well, William K. Vanderbilt, Jr. was the heir to the railroad fortune of the Vanderbilt family. He was the great-grandson of Cornelius Vanderbilt. And there were a lot of different Vanderbilts, and they all had different interests. Some went into businesses. Some of them just had the, a life of leisure. Well, Willie K., as his friends called him, he had a love and a passion for automobiles and going fast. And remember, this was just at the turn of the century. So the automobile was like a, a new invention. It was, it was mainly uh, you know, uh, used by the wealthy to right. get from one place to the other. And for some people, like Willie Kay, they raced these cars. And it wasn't here in the United States, but Willie Kay would race the automobiles with some of the greatest European drivers of the day uh, throughout Europe and usually uh, city to city contests. In the book, he's described, in your book, he's described as a daredevil. Was he a daredevil? And was the early days of car racing, automobile racing, was it dangerous? Oh, uh, it was. He was a daredevil, and it was dangerous. Remember, these cars were, were, could, had the capacity of going about 100 miles per hour. Uh, the brakes weren't that great. The tires weren't that fantastic. And the cars were not that durable. It was very difficult to control. So he was a bit of a daredevil. As a matter of fact, when he would take his car out on Long Island and in Newport, he would invariably get arrested for going fast and speeding. So he, he really needed a venue where he could exercise his passion to go fast, and that was out in Europe. On the screen now, the Vanderbilt vision unfolds.
I love the video. Then and now. Then it was Mr. Vanderbilt. Now it's you. What led to your involvement? Because I think for you, this is uh, not a labor of love. This is beyond that. This is a true passion. Uh, obsession, I would Obsession? Say. Okay. Yeah. I wanted you to say that, not me. <laughs> yeah. So well, my first interest came about where I read that Glen Cove Road was part of the Vanderbilt Cup race course. And uh, Glen Cove Road is very close to where my house is. And I couldn't believe that Glen Cove Road was part of a race course. So I said, you know, on a, on a day off, I'm going to go to the Vanderbilt Museum and research it and find out exactly about the Vanderbilt Cup races, about Glen Cove Road, where was this course? So I said, oh, I'll spend an hour in the archives of the Vanderbilt Museum. They were very gracious. They let me go into the private files of William K. Vanderbilt, Jr. And sure enough, I saw these books and books of of the Vanderbilt Cup races. Mm -hmm. They had the old magazines, old newspapers about the races. Sure enough, Glen Cove Road was, was part of the race course. And that one hour has turned into eight years now of research. How hard was it to put the film together? Because we know a little bit about what it takes to put it together. A little promo for two minutes can take hours and hours and hours. Um, the way this whole film in, involved and unfolded was really, really fascinating. We didn't know a lot about that right. racing at Roseville Field. To put this all together, how much time was it? Oh, I'd say that film took about uh, two years of research where some of the films were readily available. That 1904 film is part of the paper print collection of the Library of Congress. That 1906 film came from private collectors that I had to purchase the films and edit it and put it in sequence for. And some of it was just researching it and finding some of those strange films. That 1914 film with uh, Charlie Chaplin it was, it was amazing because it was a Matt Sennett film and basically he stole part of the scenes of the Vanderbilt Cup races while he was shooting the film. The people in the background of that film do not realize they're part of a Matt Sennett film. And uh, you could see their reactions. They're trying to watch the race. Meanwhile, uh, Charlie Chaplin's slapping people. What does it mean to own a vintage race car that was actually in one of the cup races? Well, I'm lucky enough to own the uh, Alco that won the 1909 and 1910 Vanderbilt Cup races. And it's uh, a lot of fun. We, we use this car to go to different charity events, different car shows. Um, and it, it's spectacular. We, we, uh, we bring it to uh, street festivals, the Great Neck uh, Street Festival. We've been there two years. Mm -hmm. and. I allow the kids to sit in the car and, and get their picture taken with it, and it's, uh, it brings a lot of smiles to me and a lot of smiles to the people who sit in the car. I'm going to go back to the first race, under three minutes left, 1904. Where is there an element of class warfare? You've got the Vanderbilts and all the spectators and their friends and family and the people on the actual race course. Was there an aspect of class warfare? Oh, oh definitely, because... To get this race, they had to run the race on public roads, including Jericho Turnpike right here through Floral Park. It went through the, the towns, and the, these were the major venues where the farmers would use to bring their goods into the city. So when they announced the Vanderbilt Cup races in August of 1904, the farmers were outraged. They said, oh, what, they, we, how are we going to bring our goods without the availability of these roads? So they immediately filed, filed suit against Vanderbilt, and, and his business associates saying that you cannot use these roads during the Saturday morning. We need it. So there was a big court battle. And for 1904, it went down to like two days before the race where the judges decided in favor of Vanderbilt that he could have this race. Two minutes left. I had a friend who had a lot of cars and had a Ferrari. And when we drive down the parkways in a Ferrari, heads would turn. When you take your car on the road, our heads turning. It's not garage. You actually take it out. We our do. heads we turning do. when you're out there driving around uh, the local he neighborhood. Heads turning and uh, staring and they're in bewilderment because the car, it looks like nothing else that's on the road, obviously, but it also sounds like nothing else. It, it sounds like an airplane coming down the road. So it gets your attention blocks away and people, again, they smile at it, they wave, and it's, it's just a lot of fun to see this car being driven. All right, one last thing, real quick. What was the, the hidden gem in this book, something you didn't know anything about and that you found kind of opened your eyes? I think what, what really opened my eyes was how beautiful Long Island was back in the 1900s and how the people really were dressed so formal 
and they came out. You cannot find out of hundreds of thousands of people who came to this race, there is not a gentleman there who's not wearing a cap or a derby, and the women are in their, their, their best dresses. Right. So it was very much formal, and uh, they all seemed to have a, a wonderful time. It's been a great time. We are out of time. You have to come back and bring your car one day and talk more about that. I'll do that, Larry. I'm Larry Davidson, for everyone here at Davidson & Company. Thanks for coming, and we will see you next time.